Hello there, I'm a day late reviewing 1976's The Outlaw Josie Wales. The Outlaw Josie Wales is based on the 1972 novel The Rebel Outlaw Josie Wales by Asa Earl Carter under the pen name Forrest Carter. The novel was later re-released under the title Gone to Texas and that is the credit it is given in the movie. I've not read the novel so I don't know how faithful the movie is to it. Knowing Hollywood, I imagine changes have been made. The movie appears to be inspired by the period of time from 1854 to 1859 along the Kansas-Missouri border, often referred to as Bleeding Kansas. During these years, free staters from Kansas and border ruffians from Missouri would cross the state borders and raid and kill in the other state, which leads us to the beginning of the movie. The Outlaw Josie Wales is a revenge movie, something that Eastwood is no stranger to, having made several revenge films over his career. But as we'll come to see, there is more to the story than that. We open in Missouri with a farmer named Josie Wales trying to plow his field with his young son when his wife calls the son back to the house to get cleaned up. Josie continues on with the work at hand until he hears multiple hoofbeats and sees smoke rising from the direction of his house. He takes off to see what's going on and he arrives to find a band of men dragging his wife out of their burning house while the screams of his son can be heard from inside. The men are wearing red leggings. Before he can do anything about it, a man rides up and clubs him with the butt of his saber and then cuts his face with the blade. Josie falls to the ground and then loses consciousness. When he awakens, his house is lying in ashes. Then we see him digging the graves of his now dead wife and son. He mourns for a bit and then digs out a pistol from the ruins of his house and begins to practice shooting. It doesn't go so well at first. Missed it by that much. But eventually, he does improve. Not long after, while he is sitting watch over the graves, another group of riders approaches. This time from Missouri. They are led by Bill Anderson and they are after the Redlegs, as the Kansas Raiders are called. Josie tells Bill that he will be going with them. We then get the opening credits of the movie and are given a montage of Union and Confederate soldiers fighting. Many raids are led by Bill and Josie, who as we will learn, make names for themselves during the war. Just as the credits are almost done, we see a mortally wounded Bill encouraging Josie to keep going. Once the credits are done, we see the group of raiders from Missouri holed up in the woods on a hill. It has been announced that Lee has surrendered and the war is over. Captain Fletcher tells them that they are the last ones left. All they have to do is go down to the nearby Union camp and swear an oath of allegiance to the United States and they are free to go home and resume their lives. Fletcher says that he's going to do it as he has seen enough war. Everyone agrees. Everyone but Josie, that is. At the Union encampment, Captain Fletcher meets with Senator Lane. He is stunned to see that a number of the Union troops here are red legs. He had been promised that regular troops would be accepting the surrender. As it turns out, Senator Lane isn't interested in their surrender. As far as he's concerned, the Confederates are traitor and all need to be shot. It's a trap. The Confederate troops are all lined up to take the Oath of Allegiance when Josie can be seen riding towards the camp. The Union trooper giving the oath signals the other Union troops and dives out of the way. A Gatlin gun hiding in a wagon opens fire, cutting down most of the Confederates. Union troops also burst forth from their tents with guns drawn and start shooting at the Confederates who are trying to flee. In the chaos, Josie rides to the back of the wagon and kills the soldiers manning the Gatlin gun. He then uses it to start mowing down Union troops. A young confederate named Jamie manages to get onto a horse and he tells Fletcher to make a break for it when he is shot in the back by a red leg named Terrell. Jamie rides off toward Josie and tells him to make a break for it. Josie sees that the kid is wounded and decides to help him to safety. Senator Lane tells Fletcher that he wants him to hunt down and kill Wells for this mess. Fletcher says that he hasn't left him much choice thanks to the massacre that the senator has orchestrated here today. In the hills, Josie and the kid are riding along and Josie says that they will head for the Indian nations to hide out and give the kid some time to heal. They get some supplies at a wilderness store and Josie is applying a poultice to the kid's wound when he hears something. He starts to reach for his gun when a bounty hunter sticks a rifle in his face. A second one jumps out of the bush, rifle also pointed at Josie. They get him to drop his gun belt when the kid starts singing. The bounty hunters tell him to shut up and the kid pretends to think that one of them is his father. The kid says that he has the gold that he and Josie robbed from the bank. The leader of the bounty hunters has his partner go over to the kid to get the gold when the kid pulls his pistol from under the blanket and shoots the nearest bounty hunter. 
Josie pulls a pistol from a shoulder holster and he shoots the leader and then they are back on the road. But before they go, the kid bemoans the fact they don't have a time for a proper burial and Josie replies. The hell with them fellas. Buzzards gotta eat, same as worms. Later, it's raining so Josie sets up a small shelter for the kid while he scouts the area for Union troops. When he gets back, the kid is dead. He puts the kid's body on his horse and has it race through the nearby Union camp, causing a diversion so that he can continue on his way. A bit later we see an old Indian man named Lone Wadi come out of a cabin in the woods. He starts walking through the woods hunting when he sees Josie's horse come charging through a clearing. As he tracks the horse with his rifle, a pistol comes into frame from behind him. It's Josie. Lone Wadi bemoans the fact that he is now old and that the white man can sneak up on him. He rambles on about the troubles of the Indian people that have become civilized and were screwed over by the white man while Josie makes his way over to the cabin and then takes a nap on the porch. Cut to the Red Legs contingent digging grave for the kid. Fletcher rides up and Terrell says the kid was killed trying to sneak through the camp. There is no way that Wales could have made it through into the Indian nations. Fletcher laughs and heads towards the nations. Seeing this, Terrell tells his men that they are heading into the nations as well, and he puts a $5,000 bounty on Wales. Josie wakes up to find Lone Wadi waiting for him. Lone Wadi thinks that they should head to Mexico. Josie, on the other hand, is looking forward to going back to Missouri for some unfinished business. Lone Wadi tells Josie that he has heard that General Shelby and some troops have gone down to Mexico way, and he is looking to join up with them. This piques Josie's interest. As for Wadi, he was planning on going to a nearby trading post to get a horse for the journey. Josie tells him that he will go down to the post and get the horse for him. We cut to the trading post where we see a somewhat skeevy looking trader dealing with two rough looking trappers. The trappers decide to help themselves to an Indian girl that is working for the trader when Josie shows up. He asks the trader if he has any horses for sale. The trader says that the horses are the trappers. He sees them with the Indian girl and asks the trader if he thinks that they will be long. One of the trapper gets up to get something from the trader when he pulls his pistol and points it at Josie. He recognizes Josie and alerts his partner that they have five grand standing before them. The other trapper gets off the Indian girl and points his gun at Josie. Now it's game on. Game on! Game on! The first trapper tells Josie to slowly pull his guns out, but first to give them to his partner. Josie complies and we see this. Josie then takes the trapper's horses and joins back up with Lone Wadi. The Indian girl is named Little Moonlight and she joins up as well, grateful that Josie rescued her from those trappers. They continue their journey south and come to a small town in Texas. It's here that we meet Grandma Sarah and Laura Lee. Grandma Sarah is a proud and very opinionated Kansan very much willing to let everyone know what is on her mind. Josie buys some supplies at the general store and is headed back to his horse when he runs into a snake oil salesman that recognizes him. He screams that it's Josie Wales, gaining the attention of four nearby Union soldiers. None of them look too thrilled about having to face down the outlaw. Josie has a question for them. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Oops, wrong question. Why well, you gonna pull those pistols and whistle Dixie? Josie kills three of them and Lone Wadi, who was nearby, kills the fourth. They then jump on their horses and head out of town. There are more Union soldiers in town and they gather up to give chase, but the Indian girl blocks their path. Josie and Lone Wadi make their way out into the desert when they see that someone is following them. It turns out it's a little moonlight. They make their way into Comanche territory and come across some wagon tracks. Little Moonlight thinks it's the Comancheros. They are bad news. Thugs that trade guns, liquor, and women with the Comanche. They see some smoke up ahead and decide to get to higher ground for a better look. It is Comancheros, and they have ambushed the Kansans that were immigrating to Texas. The men have been killed, and the Comancheros are looting the wagons when they discover Laura Lee. Now we get to find out what happens to young pretty women when the only men around are brutes who take what they want. I like rape. <laughs> Josie is about to intervene when the Comanchero leader shows up and pulls his men off of Laura Lee. A fresh, unsullied girl will bring better bounty with the Indians. 
While this is going on, Lone Wadi has moved to a better vantage point, but he slips and tumbles down the hill. Not only that, he causes a rock to tumble down towards the Comancheros, alerting them to his presence. Several of the Comancheros ride around the hill and find him at the bottom, on the other side. They then take him prisoner along with the surviving Kansans and head towards the camp of the local Comanche chief named Ten Bears. A bit later, the Comancheros see a lone figure on horseback up ahead of them. It's Josie, and he is flying a white flag on his rifle. He wants to parlay. Parlay? Down to the depths, whatever mutton they thought of parlay! Four Comancheros ride up to see what Josie wants. Josie sizes them up, and then it's game on. Game on! Game on! Once Josie kills the Comancheros, the always friendly and grateful Grandma Sarah expresses her gratitude. Kill us, I suppose. In the hills above them, they see several Comanche braves and decide to get a move on before things get hairy. Later, the group stops to get some rest and eat. Grandma Sarah relates that they were heading to her son Tom's ranch near the town of Santa Rio. It's supposed to be wonderful with a creek and nice pastures for cattle, lots of trees, a genuine paradise. They eventually make their way to Santa Rio and discover it's a dead town. Going into the saloon, Josie finds the last remaining members of the town. The town was founded near a silver mine, and when the silver ran out, everybody else left. Josie brings in some whiskey he liberated from the Comancheros, and the locals are thrilled. Excellent! The rest of the group comes into the saloon and meets the locals, two of whom, Travis and Chato, used to work on Tom's ranch. Not only that, but Grandma Sarah gets to meet, let's say, Tom's lady friend. It's here that we learn Grandma Sarah's son died in the war and served as a red leg. The two workers for Tom offer to work for Grandma Sarah, and everyone sits down for a drink. Through a window, Josie notices two bounty hunters walk up to the building across the street. One of them walks into the saloon and announces that he is looking for Josie Wales. Josie cops to it and asks the man if he's a bounty hunter. The man says that he has to do something for a living. Then we get another great line. Diane ain't much of a living boy. Joseph gives the man the option to leave, and the man takes it. But only briefly. It's a mistake that proves fatal. The bounty hunter's partner outside then flees. The wagon train then continues out to Tom's ranch at Blood Butte. It is indeed quite nice. Granny's in a hurry to get everything up and running again. She tells everyone that this is their place too, if they aren't afraid of work. The next day we get a montage of work around the ranch until Lone Wadi and Travis and Chato have some cattle and are going to head into Santa Rio for a bit. Later, while Granny Sarah, Laura Lee, and Josie are gathered saying a prayer of thanks, Josie sees an injured Lone Wadi returning on his horse. Travis and Chato have been captured by the Comanche, and Lone Wadi says that Tin Bears is coming for the rest of them in the morning. Cut to that night. Josie explains to those left how to use the shuttered window gun ports explains that they need to keep a fire going in the chimney. He gives them a plan of action for when the Comanche arrive. The next morning, Granny sees Josie packing up and getting on his horse and asks Lone Wadi, what is he doing? Lone Wadi explains that Josie is a guerrilla fighter and is going out to meet the Comanche on his terms. Josie rides out to the Comanche camp and he meets with Ten Bears. The two talk and Ten Bears is impressed with Josie's honesty and bravery and then decides to live in peace with the ranchers of Blood Butte. Josie in return says that when the Comanche moves through the area when the seasons change, they are welcome to some of the cattle from the ranch, and they will put a brand on the lodge showing that they are friendly with the Comanche. Tin Bear then releases Travis and Chato, and they return with Josie to the ranch. Once back at the ranch, they have a celebration. Meanwhile, in Santa Rio, Captain Fletcher and Terrell's Redlegs ride into town. They hide their horses and get inside several buildings, waiting for Josie to return to the town. Back at the camp that night, Josie and Laura Lee get to know one another, and it leads to a little sexy time. Afterwards, Josie has a nightmare of his family being killed by the Red Legs, and he decides he doesn't really need these attachments. It's time to move on. Lone Wadi catches Josie packing to leave. Josie says that he will be back in a year, maybe two, and for Lone Wadi to keep an eye on the rest of the ranchers for him. He starts to ride off, but only makes it about a dozen yards when he encounters the Redlegs riding towards the ranch. Josie halts and lets the Redlegs ride up to him. 
It's looking pretty bad for Josie when several rifles poke out of the windows of the ranch house. Then all hell breaks loose and bullets start flying. Eventually the ranchers kill just about all the redlegs except for Captain Terrell, who flees. Josie gives pursuit and catches him in Santorio. They have a bit of a showdown, and Josie eventually runs Terrell through with his own sword. Josie then makes his way over to the saloon and finds the residents telling a pair of Texas Rangers and Captain Fletcher that Josie Wales was killed in Mexico when he took on five pistoleros. They sign an affidavit that says Josie Wales is dead, and the Rangers leave. Fletcher tells him that he doesn't believe that five pistoleros could kill Josie Wales, that he might just head on down to Mexico to see for himself. Josie and Fletcher move to the street away from the others. Josie asks, and then? Fletcher replies it's up to Wales. He owes him that. Also that the war is over. Josie says, I reckon so. I guess we all died a little in that damn war. Fletcher then watches as Josie mounts up and rides off into the sunset. The end. So there you have it, that law Josie Wales. I first saw this on TV with my dad sometime back in the late 70s. He had seen it in a theater and it's one of his favorites. I'm glad he introduced me to the film and I have rewatched it many times since then. It's thanks to my dad that I've come to know the movies of Clint Eastwood, or as the wife and I call him, Squint. It's probably unfair to say that Squint is best known for bringing pain to bad guys in his movies, but I will say this, he's done his fair share. The movie has a fair number of quotable lines. Alice coming to breakfast. That right this damn woman doing something like this to me. I used to have power. God, you stopped me when you did. I might have killed her. Oh, I noticed that. I didn't surrender neither, but uh, they took my horse and made him surrender. It is good that warriors such as we meet in the struggle of life or death. And I like that Josie isn't some indestructible killing machine. He does get wounded and several people get the drop on him throughout the movie. And while he might be the prime mover in the film, his bacon is saved by others on more than one occasion. I also like the fact that the movie isn't just a pure revenge film. Now don't get me wrong, Josie does get his revenge, but he also helps to create that small community with the ranch in Texas. He creates a peace between them and the Comanche, and when Fletcher tells them that the war is over, rather than engage in another shootout, Josie decides that he has had enough of men butchering men and rides off, hopefully for a better life. All in all, I heartily recommend the film. The movie was directed by Clint Eastwood, best known for High Plains Drifter, Pale Rider, Heartbreak Ridge, Unforgiven, and Million Dollar Baby. The last two movies earn Eastwood an Oscar for Best Director. These are but a few of the 45 movies that he has directed, most of which are worth seeing. An interesting behind-the-scenes story about the movie, writer Philip Kaufman was the original director of the film until Clint and him both became interested in Sandra Locke. Next thing you know, Kaufman is out of a job and Clint is running the show. Kaufman raised a big stink with the Directors Guild, and they would later institute a rule that if a director was fired from a movie, that none of the existing actors or producers could take over as the new director, that they would have to find someone not already associated with the film to direct. This is known as the Eastwood Rule. The script was written by Philip Kaufman and Sonia Chernus. Kaufman is best known for The Outlaw Josie Wales, Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Right Stuff, and The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Chernus is known for The Big Fix and The Outlaw Josie Wales, and a couple of episodes of Rawhide and Mr. Ed. The movie stars Clint Eastwood, Chief Dan George, John Vernon, Bill McKinney, Sandra Locke, and Paula Truman. I'll do a fine job with Eastwood and Chief Dan George doing the heavy lifting. The movie was rated PG for mild violence and sexual situations. It cost $3.7 million to make and earned $31.8 million, so it made money. The critics liked it. It has a 7.8 out of 10 on IMDb, a 90% critic score and a 91% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and it has a 69 out of 100 on Metacritic. My dad passed while I was making this video, so I'm not going to be able to watch it with him anymore. But I will always think of him when I watch it in the future. Thanks for the good times, Dad. You'll be missed. Anyways, thanks for watching, and until next time. That's one small step for man. Not